There is no life whatever beyond the edge of the world. There is no life whatever beyond the edge of the world. Admiral Richard Byrd explored more uncharted land than any other man in history. He was a man of action, but he was a man of thought as well. An explorer, and a scientist, an adventurer, and a philosopher. A complete man. One of the men in history who had to lead the way. <laughs> On this expedition, we hope to fly across the South Pole into the mysterious land beyond to see what is there. To the cameraman who made this picture, I want to give full credit. They did not hesitate to risk their lives at their job. Now the North Pole is the center of a deep ocean, whereas the South Pole is the center of a high plateau which averages seven or eight thousand feet in altitude. There is no life whatever beyond the edge of the world. There is no life whatever beyond the edge of the world. There is no life whatever beyond the edge of the world. There is no life whatever beyond the edge of the world. There is no life whatever beyond the edge of the world. There are no Eskimo. It is too cold for human beings uh, to live there permanently. When we left on this expedition, we were, to put it very mildly, extremely anxious to find out if it existed, would we be able to find it? And that was the great question. We left on this expedition from the Navy Yard at Boston. Here is our supply ship, the Rupert. Just a big unprotected iron ship of 8,000 tons. And here is our icebreaker, the Bear, which we took as a protection for the personnel of the Rupert and also to use exploring in dangerous ice areas. We took with us this time 150 Eskimo dogs and more than 14,000 different kinds of items for two years away from civilization where there were no supply depots around the corner. Day followed day, a week followed week as we penetrated the great Pacific. We headed straight south. And here we have an ordinary unprotected iron ship sailing in seas no ship had ever been in before since the world began. It wasn't that we were any better than our predecessors. We simply had a more open ice here. We bucked the ice till we were finally stopped by an impossible pack. Impossible at least for the Rupert. But we wanted to see what was beyond the horizon. That's what we came for, and for that purpose, we had another string to our bow, aviation. We retreated a few miles and managed to find an open lake in the ice field, so we proceeded to put the plane overboard. We had to execute this maneuver as rapidly as possible, because we knew that under the influence of the wind and the tide, the fields would soon close in around the ship again. In fact, the ice is already beginning to close in. Our plan was to go south with our steamer until we were stopped by ice, then to take up the attack on the unknown with aviation. And now at last we are going to find out what was in the southern part of this mysterious part of the world. For after battling the bad weather, here we are 240 miles within it. came to this strange phenomenon, ice islands. This was a strange and weird sea. Steaming through these ice islands was an eerie sensation. Here was the twilight of the gods. And we were curious to know 
what these somber giants were guarding. the dice fell our way, for the elements acted in our favor, the wind and the tide which had closed the ice in around us finally opened the pack so that we could break our way into more open sea. We had added nearly half a million square miles to the Pacific Ocean. And here is our journey's end. At length we sighted that great natural phenomenon, the ice barrier. I knew it would be taking a big chance, but it seemed the only way. As we started alongside the barrier with our ships, suddenly the edge... Enough of ice falling to sink a fleet of ships. It seemed like a warning from Providence not to go alongside the barrier. We therefore had to unload from the bay ice. We had to put our tractors overboard with the engines running to safeguard the lives of the drivers as the ice was constantly breaking off. We had to get the tractors quickly away from the edge of the crumbling ice. We came within an ace of losing overboard our principal plane of exploration the William Hawley. It was a critical moment. At times, as the ice broke, then our supplies would fall into the water. We kept a man on watch with a life preserver on line as a safeguard for the men working on the edge of the ice. We were working against time to finish unloading before the fall freeze up when the ships would have to return to civilization. You can see what a tough job we had to transport 400 tons of material through this area. The bay ice was constantly shifting and cracking, and pressure ridges were being formed as we worked by the irresistible force of the slowly moving ice cap. I have never seen men work so hard. With 24 hours of daylight, they could and often did work the clock around without stopping. We call this period the white nightmare, and a nightmare it was. The hardest work of all was this man hauling of sleds, which we had to do in order to get unloaded in time. Eskimo Huskies, still the backbone of polar exploration. They can go where no tractor could ever go. You can't do without them. The Rupert must go back to civilization because the bay would soon freeze and she couldn't stand the ice. Now the only person out of 150 men to get sick and who would have to go back on the Rupert was the doctor. At very great risk, I had to dispatch the bear northward to get another doctor, for I pledged myself not to risk men for a year on the ice without medical care. There would be anxiety over the bear. Suddenly, without warning, a storm hit us before we could get all of our food and other vital supplies stored away. And all hands had to work frantically throughout the storm to prevent the loss of food boxes under deep snow drifts. The storm lasted for many hours. We 
we found it chilly working in the wind. And when it was over, there was a bit of digging to do. And here is the original commando. The honor of leading this expedition belongs to Admiral Richard Byrd. It is a gratifying experience for this 58-year-old explorer, who in the past had to raise his own funds for exploration, and who now has the resources of the United States Navy at his command. In 1955, two years before his death, Admiral Richard Byrd departs on his fifth and last expedition. But it's not simply an unknown continent or a distant ocean that lures adventurers like Richard Byrd. As he put it, here is a door ajar through which one may escape from the noise and chaos of civilization into the solace and harmony of the cosmos and for a moment be part of it.